Welcome everybody. And so, oh, we have some more. Okay, now I would die. So since we have a few new people in the group, I thought I would um, give a little bit of a, a talk that I give usually um, to begin with, to make sure that everybody has a good understanding of the, the whole path that the Buddha taught and his happy samadhi, or I like to call it Buddha jhana, <laughs> but uh, this is just the word that I use. Um, and as we uh, traveled through the four Brahma Viharas in the past four sessions, we did the loving kindness as we've been doing for quite a while, and then the compassion, and then the joy, and last session was equanimity or calm. And Today, this sutta that I will be reading to you, the Buddha explains the, the jhanas, the meditation that he taught, with in relation to uh, the body and how it relates to the body. Because the Buddha was very um, keen on using the body as a vehicle for awareness or simply a resting place of our awareness. And this is sometimes um, practiced in all kinds of ways, but without getting too far into this <laughs> topic at the beginning, I will be um, guiding a body meditation today and today will be the beginning of uh, an exploration through the four satipatthanas which I translate as the resting places of awareness. These four things, these four aspects of reality of our experience that are simply happening all the time. The four satipatthanas, the resting places of awareness, are body, sensations, mind, and dhamma, mental states. And these things are continually happening. And that is the beauty of them, is that we don't need to do anything about it. <laughs> is that they are already there, here and now. And in fact, it is by letting go of everything else that we get to be clearly and fully aware of them, like the Buddha said, sampajanya, sati sampajanya. But this bodily awareness, we've been practicing the loving kindness for quite a while now. And for those who have been here for, for a few talks, and this, these satipatthanas, they are not rigid or cold or void of joy. It doesn't mean that because we're practicing satipatthana practice that the seven supports of awakening stop working. In fact, they are working uh, quite wonderfully with these four resting places of awareness and we will begin to see how this works today and I will be giving a, a further talk coming on how the, the Buddha actually taught the Brahma Viharas and the Satipatthanas very very often and combined and as uh, different kinds of meditations that have 
very wonderful results and that work completely together. And so I invite you now to close your eyes and take a comfortable posture. And if there's any tension in your body, whether it's in your shoulders, your neck, your back, your legs, maybe your arms, your face, just let it all go. Let it all fade away and smile. Whether we practice the love or we practice the compassion or the joy or the calm or any one of the four resting places of awareness, The smile is always present, always appropriate, always helpful. Whatever happened to you today, or yesterday, or the day before, or whatever you're planning to do after this talk, or tomorrow, or this week sometime, just let it all go. And smile. Notice the weight off your shoulders. Whatever your mind is trying to think right now or trying to make you believe that you should be thinking about something, about this or that, just Leave it be. Smile. Let the mind unwind. And notice how good it feels. To release, to relax, to let go of the tension. And smile.
simply by smiling you're practicing the third step of right effort or wise practice which is to bring up a wholesome state as soon as you smile there is a wholesome state and the body becomes calm the joy helps you become calm and the calm helps you be joyful and awareness begins to steady itself it becomes established because we are happy here and now because the mind is content not looking outward It is not restrained, pushed, or pulled in this way or that way. Simply happy here and now. And as you calm down any tension in your body, dissolving any stiffness with a smile on your lips, a smile in your heart and in your mind, you might notice that quite naturally in fact the awareness of your own body becomes quite clear and that nothing needs to be done for that to happen it simply is in fact awareness of our own bodies is always present it is always happening though we are not always paying particular attention to it getting involved in this or that the mind is being directed in this way or that way is not taking the time to smile and let go and simply rest upon this naturally occurring awareness 
of this body. with a smile. with the joyful happiness that comes from letting go. Enjoying this letting go. Letting go of any tension that might arise in the body. Letting go of any disturbances that might arise in the mind. Becoming lighter. If your mindfulness slips, if it starts becoming discontent with what is happening now, you can remember a good action that you did, someone you helped, or something that made you happy and smile. And when your mind is uplifted again, and it is happy and content here and now, simply knowing your whole body with a smile. happy body you can let go of that memory and simply rest the mind again just upon body
tension arise, any stiffness around your forehead or your skull, can you let it go? Can you give it up, release it? Can you relax it? And smile again. Is your mind making up a story about body or this meditation? Is it judging or criticizing something about your present experience? Can that be a let go? Can that be relaxed? And smile again. Smile at the monkey mind. You might notice that as you let go and smile and relax, you become more aware, continually aware. And with this clear awareness, we can see subtler and smaller tension and distraction and we can let these go also and smile
this is a principle the Buddha called Samatha Vipassana. Tranquility and seeing clearly. Letting go and awareness. Yoked together. For a few moments, I invite you to bring up the feeling of love inside your heart. This warm, radiant, bright feeling of care, of goodwill. and to allow it to spread through your whole body. With a smile. Allow it to shine outwards to all living beings in all directions. Unbounded, unrestricted. Like the sun shines its light throughout the universe. It's not thinking about it. It simply is doing it. So to allow your love to be universal to shine in all directions. Without a condition. Without a particular reason. for the sake of love, for the sake of happiness.
allowing your mind to move into listening to the Dhamma. in carrying this wonderful awareness that you've been cultivating for these few minutes. the talk that I will be giving or the discourse that I will be reading tonight is the Samanya Palasutta, the fruits of the monk life. But this is not only for monks, literally, this is quite for anybody that is practicing this path. And in fact, this is more the fruits of this wonderful meditation and this path that the Buddha taught. What is its purpose? Why practicing in this way? And in the collection of long discourses, this is the second sutta. And the first sutta of this collection, which is the first collection of the suttas in the, the canon, the first sutta is very advanced. But from the second sutta on, which begins the, the canon, the Buddha explains in the twelve following suttas his path of practice. And he used a quite um, a stock uh, definition of his teaching or a way that he would explain his teaching that he would explain he would use that uh, exposition of his path a lot. He would always change it here and there to adapt, to fit his audience to whether it was a question that was put to him and he would answer quite skillfully changing uh, a few things here and there in the path to adapt it to um, the person he was talking to. But generally it remained quite uh, the same. And for the next 12 suttas, this path, this exposition of the path is, um, is central. It comes back every time. And this is telling us quite, uh, quite a lot about uh, how important this path, this exposition is. And I believe it's quite an essential in, in the Buddha's teaching to know, uh, to know this wonderful discourse and to understand uh, what really is this path that the Buddha taught from the beginning. And here, this is a long discourse, obviously, so, uh, and here it is abridged. Uh, quite a lot and I go really to the core but it still uh, is a, uh, a good sutta uh, so I will try to be diligent in the reading but um, 
here to give you a bit of a context this is happening in um, in Magadha and the king the king of Magadha King Ajatasattu is uh, on this Uposata day this observance day it's a fasting day every two weeks and uh, he wants to seek advice from a spiritual master and one of his uh, ministers is saying well that the Buddha completely awakened is in his mango grove and so that he he is invited to go and visit him if he if he likes so they harness the hel the elephants and they decide to go on a little evening trawl to see the Buddha and the king arrives at the monastery um, if I'm not mistaken, this is the bamboo grove um, and sees the Sangha of monks all quiet, all very uh, calm and composed and the Buddha is sitting there and the king is very much impressed because at, the, at that time there was the, the main mode of uh, practice was usually talking and debating about philosophical standpoints and views and so he goes to the Buddha and they exchange some courteous talks and the King Ajatasattu uh, asks this question to the Buddha he says dear Bhante there are various professions and crafts such as chefs and barbers and soap makers, cooks, gardeners and dyers, weavers, reed workers and potters, translators and accountants, and now those who with similar professions and skills. They live by the visible fruits of their professions. They themselves happily enjoy this. Their mothers and fathers happily enjoy this. Their children and wives happily enjoy this. Their friends and relatives happily enjoy this. They can hereby support the spiritual life and offer to wandering seekers and Brahmins. They stand in what is divine, in what has a happy result, in what is condu conducive to the celestial abodes. Bhante, is it possible to reveal any visible fruit of the truth-seeking life? And now at that time, at the Buddha's time, there was two main uh, spiritual um, modes of practice. There was uh, Brahmins, which, which were uh, mainly priests, that were um, a very respected caste at that time, still is, and very, uh, it's the priestly caste, which were doing, um, they had land, they had property, they had um, family. And there was this other movement, which was called the Samanas, and uh, Buddhist monks and uh, Jains, for example, are part of that same uh, movement where these people were called Samanas because they left everything. They left and they just took the road and went meditating in the forest or some, something like that. And so these people, they left everything. And so the king, just so you understand the question of the king here, is that why would anybody would do that? And why would anybody uh, dedicate their entire life or to, to pursue uh, uh, these, these things, to seek truth or seek spiritual happiness? It is possible, great king. Listen carefully and apply your mind to what I will say. Yes, Bhante. The awakened one said this. Great King, a truth finder arises in the world, an arahant, 
perfectly all awakened, endowed with righteous knowledge and righteous behavior. Now the Buddha was very much known to practice what he taught. And so he was endowed with righteous knowledge, but also he was practicing in accordance with that knowledge, which was one of the reasons why he was so uh, respected, in fact. A blissful one, knower of the world's unsurpassed guide for those who seek peace, teacher of devas and humans, awakened and exalted. He teaches the Dhamma, which is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end. In the meaning and the phrasing, he embodies and shines forth the completely perfected and utterly pure spiritual life. Then this Dhamma is heard by someone reborn in any family or country. Having heard this Dhamma, that person acquires faith in the Buddha. Now this, of course, is a little bit different nowadays, but it's quite wonderful that the Buddha always begins with gaining faith or confidence. And this, of course, we don't have the Buddha right now. And that is just a fact. But um, here nowadays, it's more you can hear about a meditation retreat, somebody that has a good experience, and then you acquire that faith, you acquire confidence that, oh, I want to try this because my friend looks happy and that sounds great. Well, this is the same kind of process here, just without the Buddha nowadays. Some people, though, really do get to hear, for example, a discourse, get to read the suttas, and there is this acquiring of confidence. Someone might think or resonate very deeply with what the Buddha is saying in the sutta or the discourse, and that person is really impressed. And then is that faith is always that thing that drives us to go forth, to, to move along. And whether it's going forth... Oh, good. Whether it's going forth, um, taking the robes, that's one thing, but also going forth, just meaning taking on the practice, taking on practicing the Eightfold Path, whatever you're doing, that doesn't matter. And so, faith or confidence in the teaching, in, in meditation, in practicing, in living righteously, virtuously, uh, that conduces to a happy life, acquiring confidence in this. This is always the first step. One lives self-mastered and protected by the Patimoka. Patimoka is for monks, but this is just the virtue. Continually living in righteous behavior, seeing danger in the smallest lapse of attention, undertaking the training in the virtues, skillfully conducted in physical and verbal actions, completely pure and living and good in nature, watchful over the doors of one's sense faculties, possessed of presence and full awareness, happy and content. And how is a seeker good in nature? Now we had a little bit of a summary here and he breaks it down a little further. One abandons hurting living beings. One turns away from hurting living beings. With neither stick nor sword, one lives considerate and kind, friendly and compassionate towards all living beings. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons the taking of what is not given. One turns away from taking what is not given, taking only what is offered, expecting only what is offered. One lives without stealing with inner purity. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons sexual misbehavior. One lives content and at peace, not obsessed by physical attraction. This constitutes one's good nature. 
One abandons speaking lies, one turns away from speaking lies. One is known to be to speak the truth, filled with the truth, firm and trustworthy, not a deceiver of the world. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons hurtful, hurtful speech, one turns away from hurtful speech. One does not repeat elsewhere what one has heard here in order to divide the people here. One does not repeat here what one has heard elsewhere in order to divide the people elsewhere. One is a unifier of those who are divided, a promoter of those who are united. One enjoys harmony, delights in harmony, rejoices in harmony. One speaks praise of making peace and harmony. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons coarse speech. One turns away from coarse speech, speaking with words that are polished, pleasant to ear, loving, going to the heart and civilized, endearing and loved by many. Such are the words that one speaks. This constitutes one's good nature. One abandons meaningless talk. One turns away from meaningless talk. One is a speaker of words that are timely, factual and meaningful. A speaker of Dhamma, a speaker of Vinaya, the way of life. One speaks for the purpose of laying down the burden. Words that are appropriate, reasoned, and well-defined, in connection with the meaning. This constitutes one's good nature. And as you notice, speech is always quite a big part in explaining the virtue, and it has many aspects to it. Now, of course, when we take the virtues, it's only about lying, but there is more to more to it than just uh, Musa Wada, untrue speech. And uh, the reason for that is that speech is very, very close to the mind and it's very easy to let it go <laughs> and let, let loose and not, um, not be very mindful. And in fact, Speech is always a very good indicator of our awareness and how much we pay attention and how, how careful we are. And in fact, in the Vinaya, uh, this was said about the Buddha, in fact, that the Tathagatas, the Buddhas, sometimes ask while knowing and knowing sometimes do not ask. They ask knowing the right time to ask. And they ask knowing the right time when not to ask. The Buddhas ask about what belongs to the goal, not about what does not belong to the goal. The breaking of the bridge of the Tathagatas is amongst what, what does not belong to the goal. Now, the Buddhas simply cannot have, uh, cannot give themselves to meaningless talk. It's simply uh, impossible, <laughs> apparently. The enlightened ones, the lords, questions the monk, question the monks concerning two matters. Either shall we teach Dhamma or shall we declare a training rule for the disciples? And this is a quite wonderful reflection of an awakened person also. In many ways it is described in the text. Um, but a, an, a truly uh, worthy person, which is what Arahant means. Um, because of the nature of their mind that is so pure, 
their speech will be reflecting this. And so by paying attention to our speech and what comes out uh, of our mouth, we also um, we also make sure that our mind remains straight and in the right direction. One turns away from enduring the seed kingdom and the plant kingdom. One is a one meal eater, not, not eating in the evening. One turns away from eating at improper times. And now this is m mostly for monks and there is a whole list of the virtue that keeps going but I cut it short here because it, it, is, it regards uh, monastic training mostly. But um, here we will go directly to the end of the virtue and the goal, the purpose of it. In this way, great king, for a seeker of a good nature, there is no fear arising from anywhere, since one is protected by one's virtue. Just as for a highly celebrated king of the ruling caste, who has conquered his enemies in the four directions, there is no fear arising from anywhere, and he lives protected by his conquest. In the same way, for the good-natured seeker, there is no fear arising from anywhere, because one is protected by one's own virtue. Following this entire body of the Arya's virtuous behavior, one experiences within oneself a completely blameless happiness. In this way, great king, a seeker is of good nature. And see here, this is the purpose of virtue. And in fact, fear can be a major hindrance for a lot of people. But when we practice the path for a long time, and we are very steady in virtuous behavior, and when we look back at the past and we see that there's nothing that actually we did that wasn't well-intentioned and that was not... Uh, rooted in um, goodness and good intention and we've never hurt uh, intentionally any living beings or said any lies, told any lies or committed any uh, sexual misbehavior or anything like that then the mind is just very happy and steady and this is a very potent source of wholesome happiness, which we will see later will really support our meditation. And the Buddha said himself, this virtue, the purpose of it is because it leads directly to samadhi. How is a seeker a gatekeeper of one's sense faculty? What, seeing a shape with the eye, one does not dwell on it with one's mind, nor does one dwell on any of its features. If one were to live with the visual faculty unprotected, longing, impatience, and unskillful, unwholesome states would take over one's mind. Thus one practices for its mastery. One protects the visual faculty. One becomes skilled regarding the visual faculty. Now I covered this quite extensively last talk, but it, this, is, this is a section where the Buddha talks about uh, wise awareness and wise practice at the same time, right effort and right mindfulness. And these two come together always. And they... In fact, they are found, each of, each of them is found within one another. Uh, in the definition of right mindfulness, for example, there is um, seeing the body as body. Um, uh, without covetousness or grief for the world, which I translated as uh, letting go of tensions and distractions. This part is Vinaya Loke Abhija Domana Sang, which means just what I said. And this is right 
effort in within right mindfulness because with right effort we uh, we get to experience right mindfulness <laughs> it is by letting go and letting go of unwholesome states and tension and smiling and bringing up a wholesome state like loving kindness joy uh, compassion equanimity or any of the resting places of awareness without judging without criticizing with simply that uplifted mind with a smile we have this wise awareness that the Buddha taught which is not critical it's not uh, it's completely free it's completely open and we have this wise awareness as the first step of right effort also is to be aware because we need to be aware to see anything that could arise and that is the first step of right effort and concerning this first step of right effort is this this uh, guarding the sense faculties that the Buddha is talking about here and to remember that any unwholesome state that arises always arises at any of the sense faculties that is the trigger that is where there is a contact that where that is where there's something that is experienced like a sensation and that's where a judgment will take rise will take root and this is uh, the discontent part and to be aware of these and to be aware of uh, that this is what happens and this is how it happens then we can actually we are informed and we can take the right decisions at the right time and continually let go and bring up a smile bring up a wholesome state and continue on and this protects our happiness and the samadhi or the collectedness that we have cultivated thus far hearing a sound with the ear smelling an odor with the nose tasting a flavor with the tongue touching a tangible with the body and aware of a mental object with the mind one does not dwell on it with one's mind nor does what or nor does one dwell on any of its features if one were to live with the mind faculty unprotected longing and patience and unskillful unwholesome states would take over one's mind thus one practices for its mastery one protects the mental faculty one becomes skilled regarding the mental faculty and remembering that longing and impatience and these unskillful states they are not mindful they are the opposite of mindfulness and they they happen when there is a slip when there is discontent arising with the present uh, moment with the present experience there is uh, uh, something arising and then there is discontent and then this is the open door for uh, for reaction for blind reaction and therefore we we slip into unwholesome states and this is a sliding scale it's not uh, it's not all really really bad or <laughs> it it is it depends on one's mindfulness and one's capacity to see the four noble truths at that time the hurt that we might cause ourselves if we react with anger the hurt that we might cause somebody else if we react with anger and the the pain that we're causing both and to see that and to let it go possessing this awakened self mastery one experiences within oneself a happiness that is completely blameless this is how a seeker is a gatekeeper of one's own sense faculties how is a seeker present and fully aware one is fully conscious while going forward and coming back one is fully conscious looking ahead and looking down 
One is fully conscious, moving and extending one's body, wearing the sangati, the third robes of the monk. One's bowl and one's robes. One is fully conscious while eating, drinking, chewing, swallowing. One is fully conscious while evacuating and urinating. One is fully conscious while walking, standing, sitting, sleeping, and waking up, talking and keeping silent. This is how a seeker is present and fully aware. Now this is simply whatever is arising, we just let it go and we remain with this broad awareness of what the Buddha called limitless samadhi or apamana samadhi, not grabbing onto any particular aspect of it, but remaining fully aware while doing all of these activities. And how is a seeker content? One is happy with robes to cover one's body, with alms food to, to satisfy one's stomach. And wherever one goes, one sets out taking only these things. Just as birds, wherever they fly, take nothing but their wings, and fly with themselves as only burden. In the same way, one is happy with robes to cover one's body, with alms food to satisfy one's stomach. And wherever one goes, one sets out taking only these things. This is how great king, a seeker, is content. And maybe you remember last talk, I talked about uh, four, the four requisites of the monks, but this is the four requisites for anyone to practice in comfort. The robes, the shelter, alms food, or any food, really, and medicine for when we're sick. And this was another way of talking about this contentment to see this as only uh, support for this body and maintaining this body and be happy here and now, practicing. Following the entire body of the Arya's good conduct, possessing the Arya's mastery of the sense faculties, endowed with the Arya's 